Good morning and happy Resurrection Day. We're going to start with a medley of Christ Arose and Christ the Lord is Risen Today. All right, for our next hymn, we are going to do a mashup of two different hymns. One is I Cannot Tell, which is one of my personal favorite hymns sung to the uh, melody of Londonderry Air. And then Because He Lives, which is a classic Easter hymn, right? So I got the inspiration because the end of the second verse of uh, I Cannot Tell says, Because He Lives, I'll Rise to Life Eternal. And so I thought, well, that works really nicely with the words of the song, Because He Lives. So let's give this a try, shall we? Face to 
move the stone and bless the slain with oil and spice anointing. Hallelujah. But when they came to move the stone, they saw that they were not alone. For Jesus Christ had risen. Hallelujah. 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 Christ, how Well, good morning, everybody, and happy Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. The sermon today is, uh, What If? What If? And our scripture is from 1 Corinthians <clears throat> chapter 15, verses 12 through 20. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, <clears throat> how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You still are in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. But if in this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiful. But now Christ has risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. What difference does Easter make? Well, on that first Easter Sunday, the chief priests heard that the tomb was empty. <clears throat> they called the men who had been guarding the tomb, the soldiers, and offered them money, bribed them to say that the disciples of Jesus had, had stolen the body during the night. They didn't want to hear, they, they didn't want the people to hear that a miracle had happened that could be the worst thing. We call it the original Easter conspiracy. It was the first, but not the last. The years passed, decades and generations and centuries came and went. Every time across the centuries, the ultimate point of attack on Christianity has always been right here, at the empty tomb, the resurrection, the truth behind Easter Sunday. Good Friday doesn't pose this sort of problem because the world understands death. We understand death too well. The old saying goes that there are two things for which you can't escape. <laughs> you can fill in the blanks. Read the newspaper, turn on the TV, death is forever with us. The funeral homes never go out of business because we are in a death sentence generation. Read the obituaries. They change every day because people keep dying, mostly older but sometimes younger and sometimes the tragic deaths of the very young. I used to go visit a, a lady who was uh, uh, the mother of one of our residents, and she had me read the local newspaper because she was blind. First thing she always wanted me to read was the obituaries. That was very telling for her. <clears throat> sometimes there are tragic deaths of the very young. How much younger could be the death of my first daughter? 12 hours old. No one can, ex can claim an exemption from death. There are no death credits or deductions, no loopholes, no bailouts, no wiggle room, no escape. The world does not struggle with the idea that 2,000 years ago that a man named Jesus died. That's no problem. 
The world, however, knows nothing about resurrection. It just doesn't make sense to the world. Let me ask the question again. What difference does Easter make? What difference would it make if Jesus had not risen from the dead? What, what's the big deal? What would be the difference in our world today if we found out conclusively that Jesus was still dead? What if Jesus did not rise from the dead? That's not a new question. The question is, what if has been asked for nearly 2,000 years? It's a biblical question, one you can find in our scripture reading for this morning in Corinthians. Seven times in these verses, Paul uses the little word, if. He's raising the question to show us how much hangs on that little body resurrection of our Lord. To borrow from the vernacular, this is the whole ballgame right here. Paul plays the devil's advocate in order to teach us what matters most. He's not playing a parlor game of trying to waste our time or debating over the trivial matters. We need to be reminded that an outstanding miracle lies at the heart of our faith, an outstanding miracle. We believe that something absolutely incredible happened, that a man who was dead came back to life. We believe that God raised him from the dead. That's a stupendous thing to say. Sometimes we forget how amazing this sounds. After all, if you go to the cemetery waiting for a resurrection, you'll wait a long time. You'll miss dinner. There are lots of people going in and no one coming out. You'll see plenty of funerals, but no resurrections. What are the chances that a man who had been tortured and crucified and then buried in a tomb of it raised from the dead? The odds seem against it. So when you come to this passage, we need to be calm and clear-headed as we read it. It's as if just for a moment Paul says, let me leave the church and let me stand on the outside looking in and let me ask the question, what if Jesus did not rise from the dead? What if? What if Easter really isn't true? One man called this the world's blackest assumption. And indeed it is. What if? What if? What if, does it really make a difference? So what if he didn't raise from the dead? No big deal, right? Well, Paul answers that question by showing us four disastrous consequences if Christ did not rise from the dead. Let's take some careful attention at this because the, these things are tr if these things are true, then the resurrection is false. <clears throat> Number one, if there's no resurrection, our preaching, our witness, our work, our outrage is without purpose. Paul says, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. Focus on just one word, useless. Some translations say vain, but the word, word means without con content. It means that all that we have learned has come to nothing. <clears throat> As I thought about it, I thought back in my years in school. After I graduated from college, I spent three years in seminary, then four years part time in graduate school. I remember toiling over papers, deciphering the various scriptures that were given to dissect and the doctrine we were to understand. In those days, <clears throat> We used a regular typewriter with carbon paper. I guess you all remember that. This was just about when the IBM Selectric typewriter was introduced with the correction feature built in. It was in 1961, but <clears throat> too expensive for poor seminary students. We had to use whiteout. I bought it by the case. My studies concentrated on systematic theology, which is just a fancy word for putting the truths of the Bible together in an orderly fashion. I took courses in church history and Christian education and missions and preaching and later I sweated out my senior thesis project which was entitled The Problem of Good and Evil. 
And I graduated, and within weeks, I became assistant pastor at a large church in suburban New York. There were more courses in the years to come, mainly on job experience. Big deal, what does all this have to do with anything? It has to do with that no amount of education or effort can compensate if at the heart of what you believe there is a gigantic falsehood. A lawyer cannot be effective if he, if he believes that the justice system does not work. If Christ has not been raised from the dead, then all the education in the world can overcome that one fact. And all the Christian scholars and all the Christian colleges and seminaries and all the books of all learned Christians amount to nothing if he is not raised from the dead. All the scholars across the centuries would be doing futile work, worthless writings. That's what, what Paul means when he says, string out the degrees that you want after your name, write all the books that you want, preach until you pass out or the congregation passes out, build the biggest church in the world, fill huge stadiums with great throngs, put your name in lights. If the tomb is not empty, you and I are wasting our time. Secondly, if there's no resurrection, our faith is without forgiveness. It says in the 17th verse, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sin. The word for futile is different from the word for useless. The word futile means an effort that produces no results. It's a promise with no fulfillment. It's a trip without a destination. It's a story with no end. It's a seed that produces no crop. It's a dream that never comes true. It's a game with no winners. It's a company with no product. Think of it this way. We like to say that Christ died for our sins, but how do we know that his death actually accomplished anything? The fact is that if Christ had remained in the tomb, we could never be sure that God had accepted his sacrifice. This is the greatest misery of all, not to know if our sins have been forgiven. The greatest misery of all. But our greatest security is knowing that we have been washed clean by his blood and resurrection. During that long weekend in Jerusalem, no one in the world could be certain that the death of Christ was surely been sufficient. As long as he was in the tomb, it looked like the devil and death had won, and Jesus had lost the great battle. On the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. What, what was finished? If he doesn't rise from the dead, then Jesus is finished. The story is over, and we are still in our sin. That's why the resurrection is all important. Jesus cried out to end his human existence. It is finished. And God said, I amen, and then raised his son from the dead. Because he is alive forevermore, we can know our sins are forgiven forever. That's the great issue in Paul's mind. Are we truly forgiven or not? If Christ has been raised, the answer is yes. If Christ is still in the tomb, the answer is no. Thirdly, if there's no resurrection, our death is without deliverance. The 18th chapter, 18th verse says, Thirdly, if there's no resurrection, our death is without deliverance. Paul said that Christians who have died have fallen asleep in Christ. Great way to put it. In the first century, the Greek word for a cemetery was a sleeping place. That's where the Christians bury their dead, in the sleeping place. Why did he say that? Because when you go to sleep, you expect to wake up eventually. Our time on earth is just a passing moment in the, in the continuum of our whole life. Even so, Christians have always believed that one day those who have died believing in Christ will wake up in the coming great day of the, of the resurrection, the journey into the new Jerusalem. If he's still in the tomb, there's no hope for anyone. This life is all there is, and all who are dead will stay dead forever. Fourth, if there's no resurrection, 
our service is without significance. Paul says, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitified, pitied, pitied more than all men. Paul is saying, if we don't believe that Christ was raised, we are just fooling ourselves. If Christ is still in the tomb, then an atheist, Richard Dawkins is right, Christopher Hitchens is right, Stephen Hawking is right, and all the rest of our skeptics are right. If there's no foundation for our faith, then we are nothing but self-deluded fools. And I guess I would be the biggest fool in this room. If Christ is not raised, then we have no message to preach. If Christ is not raised, we are not saved. If Christ is not raised, then let us bring the missionaries home. If Christ is not saved, let's close every church. If Christ is not raised, then every Christians, the billions for 2,000 years, have been wrong. That's what Paul means. Sometimes I hear well-being Christians say something like this. Even if the resurrection is not true, it's still better to be a Christian. Think of all the things you gain by being a Christian. You have Jesus in your heart. No, you don't. No, you don't. If he's still in the tomb, then you don't have him in your heart. He is still dead. If he's still in the tomb, then you're just playing religious games. If he's still in the tomb, then it's better not to be a Christian. I have, to, I have put it in stark terms because that's how Paul puts it. God does not play games and neither do I. I don't want to come to the end of my life, which I'm close to, and discover that I preach something that's not true. I don't want to mislead others into thinking that something is true when it's not. If Christ is still dead, then we deserve the pity of thoughtful men and women because we have believed a lie. If, 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 is there any answer, any hope, any reason to believe in the resurrection of the dead? Here's Paul's answer. But now, clear as a bell, bright as the sun, truth with no mixture of death. But now Christ has risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Consider, consider how much hangs on those two little words. But now, the resurrection of Jesus, our coming resurrection, and the resurrection of all those who have died in faith, all of it depends upon those two little words. But now, Even so, the resurrection of Jesus 2,000 years ago is God's way of saying, one day all my children will raise, rise from the dead. No, not one of them will, will be left in the grave. Every single, single one of us will be raised, immortal, incorruptible, perfect, completed, glorified, free from sickness, delivered from death, with sin gone forever, human frailty disappeared, personality retained eternally endowed, supernaturally restored, made like Jesus, all defects finally gone, all that's under construction finally completed, with healthy bodies, with clear minds, with undivided hearts, in company with all the saints of the ages, in a multitude that no man can number, we will gather around the throne, we will rejoice and laugh and sing, we will know each other more completely. We will love more deeply. We will think more clearly. We will still be who we are. We will still be more than we have ever been. We will become as what we have always wanted. We will finally see our loved ones who died in the Lord. We will meet those who went before us. We will love those who hated us. And those who have hated us will love us. We will see the saints of old. We will see our grandparents and our grandchildren O oh, marvel of the grace of God forever, we will see Jesus and bow down before him. And we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But now, but now, he arose. Hallelujah, Christ arose. It is our faith, our hope, our confidence. Who we'll believe then, who we'll believe now. 2,000 years ago, Jesus came back from the dead, never to die again. He was taken up to heaven where he is now sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
One day soon he will return to the earth as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And on that great day, the dead in Christ will rise first. Let the doubters doubt if they will. We gladly join with Christians everywhere in declaring that Jesus Christ is alive forevermore. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let us confess our faith in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He preached to the dead. The third day He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. All right, for communion, we're going to sing a medley that we've sung many, many times before. And usually I pick a song to be uh, reflective um, as we're considering the sacrifice that Jesus made. But today, we're going to sing the same song, but I want you to just uh, put a little bit more of the celebratory twist on it. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. In the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he met with his disciples in the upper room for the Passover dinner. While they were sitting there, he took the bread and he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. After they finished eating, he took the cup. He blessed it and said, This is my blood which is shed for you. 
Drink all of it in remembrance of me. And now let us say the prayer that Jesus gave us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, we're going to close the service with the one hymn that I think you must sing in order for it to be Easter, and that is, He Lives. I serve a risen Savior, He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. I see His hand of mercy, I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.